this is where the hills meet the plains, the red soil meets the black soil, the burr meets the spinifex, and the rainforest meets the bush. The Gomeroi are a second largest nation in New South Wales, and we're probably in the top three or four largest nations, Aboriginal nations in Australia. It's such a vast, uh, mysterious and ancient place, so much beauty and everything. It's our history and, it, and being our history, it's also the history of Australia. We want everybody to embrace it and learn about our culture because, you know, Aboriginal people share and that's what we want to do is we want to share our story and our knowledge. The Gomeroi Nation goes from the Hunter Valley up into Queensland and out west to Canamble. It's one of the most abundant of all places, full of resources, water, the best land. Smoking ceremonies are really important for us to carry out before we go on to sacred sites. We smoke ourselves with the sandalwood to pay respects and let the spirits of them sites know that we're there to look after the, the sites that we're going to be going around and walking on. You live in a place for over 40,000, 60,000 years. There wouldn't have been a pit of dirt you didn't tread on. This is a close example of some of the stuff that we you know, find, find in, the, in the area. Now. We've got an axe head, it's basalt. You can actually see where they've you know, grinded it down to, to form a blade. With the handle, you might get a, a tree root or a soft branch and they wrap it around it. They put sinew and that on it and resin and it holds the axe handle in place. There was a lot more to Aboriginal culture and heritage than just boomerangs and spears and a lot more effort and, and know-how went into what they were making. You can actually see stone artefacts, quite a few artefacts, only down this area down here. There was over 4,000 4, artefacts that were found. Just think how many hands touched that before us. It's really hard to explain to non-Aboriginal people the feelings and the connection that an Aboriginal person has to their country. You know, once, you, once you're on your country, there's no, there's nothing like being home. We always talk about walking on our own Darwin, the earth, the ground. You know, mm -hmm. you feel it coming up through your toes, you know. It's not about a little artefact that you pick up off the ground. It's not just about that. I mean, you know, yes, it's important, but it's the landscape that that's in. It's the story that it tells that this place it's connected to so many other sites, and if you take one away from the other, then they all lose that connection and, and their importance in the landscape and that. So that's, we have to look after each of them. There's a couple of grinding grooves where we are today in the, the park in Brogabroy. They are thousands and thousands of years old. Now, to get that, that edge, they started here and went up, and they would have just sat there and, and just kept working working that edge and just kept rubbing, just kept rubbing it. They would have started out pretty narrow and then they would have, over a period of, of thousands of years, it, it got this wide. They would have come back for generations and generations and, and done these here. Amazing, very amazing. Because it's been removed from the site where it came from, um, we've lost spiritual connection. I actually feel nothing about this rock at all now because the, the spiritual connection's gone, because you need to put it back where it come from, because it makes up a bigger picture. The area where we are today, actually, you're sitting on Red Chief, Red Chief land. He was the, the king or the prince, whatever you want to put him as. Yeah, you know, Red Chief, he was one of the most fierce warriors, you know, he'd he done a lot of um, raiding. One story I like about the Red Chief is how he sat on this well-known rock that's just on the edge of the Nemoi River. We call it Bulba Rock. He used to sit up there and make this rope. And he made this rope using emu, sinew, sinew and, and hairs. The first time he used it was when he went to Kuna Barabran. He actually got two women. What he'd do, he'd tie that rope around him because when he's stealing the women, he didn't want them to slow him up. 
it was all about him bringing them back and strengthening the tribe. But all the young girls were taken by the elders. He made it his way where he went into other tribes and got his own girls and took back with surprise the rest of the elders. He ended up having a fight with one of the chiefs out on Breezer Plains there, and it was to the death, that one, so. My belief is that at the end of the day, Red Chief became that way because of the Red Kangaroo. The, the Red Kangaroo was the, he was the one of the bosses of the whole lot of the of his little harem, you might as well say. You can't go anywhere in this country without finding evidence of our occupation. There's cave paintings, rock engravings that are thousands of years old, whether it's carved trees, whether it's a scar tree, whether it's a, a, a stone object. The bark just grows back around to protect the tree. Just right around there. See, that would have come right out. When they scar a tree in Gummeroy Law, we cut on the eastern side or western side of the tree because it gets the morning sun and the afternoon sun. And that way, you know, that's the strongest part of that tree. Well, a scar tree is uh, made for Kilman, which you carry water, food, any, or a canoe tree, or uh, a, it could be a burial to wrap the body in the bark. The one we looked at earlier, I reckon it's a big canoe. The rivers were created by Garia. Garia, the rainbow serpent, a big snake that traveled across the country. And when he was traveling through the country, he made these, these indentations in, they became rivers. 90% of our occupation of this country was on a river. We lived on the river, we fished and hunted in the river. Our lifestyle was around, based around the rivers. Yeah, now, this fella here is a uh, part of the land former. He uh, followed the uh, rainbow serpent, clean, cleaning out the rivers, the gullies, tidied the mountains, so he's important to, to the culture. And they, uh, we have a long-necked turtle, Waraba. He used to be the fastest animal on the continent, but he used to get picked on and bullied and tormented by all of the other animals. He went to our creator, Buja, to ask him, can he help him? He said, if I'm to help you, you have to sacrifice something. So he gave him a shell so that he didn't have to run anymore. He could cover himself up and the other animals could not penetrate that. We always have to sacrifice something for something that we want out of life. Through sacrifice, there's always strength on the other side of that. Fungi, bit of bush tucker, uh, yellow belly caught out of the Namai River. Going to prepare it now, put, it, put mud around him, and then chuck him straight on ash and cook him up. Bit of bush tucker. Once the mud settles and dries, turn him over, let that side dry, pull him off and peel the mud off and the scales and skin should come straight off. Just to be on the river, just to catch our fish, it's a medicine within itself being out on country. I haven't had him yellow belly for a while and he tastes beautiful. It's an important thing to us is being connected with the land. So when we go out, we get our medicines, we go out to hunt, we use our stories, which is part of that land, and also teaching the kids and handing all that down. This is a local quinine tree. It's a bush medicine tree used throughout the Gummeroy tribe. The leaf is good for um, bathing in, but I'm gonna dig around this tree down to the roots to get the root which holds the stronger part of the medicine. So it won't affect the tree as much. I won't chop that whole main root. I'll take him off here and take him off there, and that, that's plenty of medicine. <laughs> I 
and that's the medicine that comes off the root, which is the outer bark of the quinine root. Treats a lot of like sicknesses. Yeah, it's like a real good cleanser, goes through your blood. This is a picabilla and we eat these. They're our bush food and also our medicine. Uh, some of my people have just cooked them all in the ground and pulled them out of the hot ashes like that. So modern days we boil them up, then take the quills out and then put it in the oven. So it's two cooks. It's got a taste unbelievable. Put it this way, as soon as it hit the table, if you weren't standing at the table, you missed or out. Around the, around the camp to get a bit, you didn't get one because that's how quick they go. But it also is divided up and elders get yeah, first. first pick and their share. But it's also our toothpicks too. <laughs> This is a camp eye. This is where they cooked all their stuff on. Tribes used to camp, the women used to do all the cooking. They'd prepare those pits. That heat would stay in that ground for days and days. You could cook on it. It was just like, well, I suppose today they say electric oven, not for a sour oven. These are the clays. They used to roll them up in balls, put them in the fire to keep the heat. It will go a fair way down, it'll go about that deep down. Put it in the pit, cover it up with the hot ashes, hot coals. These would keep, these would be laid down, the meat and things would be put on top of it. So you really didn't need a big fire, because that's what you eat. These was your heat. We have a relationship to the earth and to the animals as part of our totemic system. And they reflect our association with our homeland area, that they are part of, um, of the makeup of who we are. I'm a red kangaroo, and that's the totem that you get as you're going through ceremony. For us, for instance, with the dinner one or the emu people, we have a responsibility to emus to make sure that um, their environment um, is suitable for them to keep on flourishing. We'd have plenty of emus, they'd have plenty of kangaroos and so on. So that they have this cycle of life, you know, making sure that they can be preserved so that we don't have animals that are dropping off. The emu in the sky is um, very important. I learned this one when I was a kid. And you look up into the southern skies and, you know, here it is, the emu. And every autumn, that's when she starts to pre prepare her nest. Then she will um, find her mate and then they will actually start to get that nest and everything going so that they can start their breeding season. And then they will lay their eggs. You know, you can sort of go and get some eggs, but you know that by the way the emu is in the sky and you'll see the emu eggs, they're little uh, cosmic clouds, but they're coming down and um, you'll know that that's the time to go and get those eggs. But if you can't see those eggs anymore, that means the male is sitting on the nest and you're forbidden then to go near their nest because then those eggs are incubating. And this is probably in June, July sort of thing. And then we get to September, October, where the eggs actually hatch. The emu in the sky is vital to our, um, our spirituality, but also our well-being because it teaches us a lot more uh, about life than just a figure that's in the sky. When the um, Gadigal people in Warung, Sydney, were, you know, they were coming into first contact um, and they were fighting, I think it was around 1830, we had heard word that they were coming. So we sent out people to go and tell every other clan group and everybody came, they sent their best warriors. When uh, Major Nunn and Thomas Mitchell were coming, um, they thought that it was rain, but it was actually our people waiting, stomping on the ground you know, like they thought they'd seen thunder. It was actually our fires at our camps waiting for them. Um, they were bashing on the possum skin drums and hitting the shields of the white box country, you know, and uh, that scared them away, you know, and uh, when the 500 people dispersed uh, back to their clan groups and their families, they actually uh, came back and they came to kill Oma 
direct descendant of a massacre from the Waterloo Creek Massacre. They took our people from there to um, Terry Oyo. That's where they moved them onto that reserve. But we certainly didn't uh, shirk the responsibility of standing up against it. And the 500 is used these days as an inspirational story. You know, we we tell our children about that. Our people have always fought, you know, for their land and they will never stop fighting for it, that's for sure. We believe that the, it was called Coolabindi, that's the Aboriginal term for it, um, and it was later on given the name Gin's Leap because of what's happened here. The story that a lot of people, a lot of non-Aboriginal people like to believe is that one of our women was promised to another Aboriginal man and that's not who she wanted to be with, so, so they chased her and they both decided rather than be apart that they'd jump off the edge of the cliff, but that's the whitewashed lover story that isn't true and it's not, you know, historically what happened there. When in matter of fact, you know, one of our women was driven off there. By the early settlers and we always pull up. All Aboriginal women from this area pull up and pay their respects. It being called gins Lee. The derogative term. The, yeah, because gin's a derogative term, you know, that was used to, back in the day, our women were, our Aboriginal women were plied with the, the drink gin and, um, you know, the men had their own way with them and all the rest of it, that was one of the things. So, you know, we were given the name gin. The first thing I say to people about our stories you hear, they're not for little golden books. They're actually about who we are as a people, our existence. They're more like the encyclopedias, not the little golden book. They're the Bible, those little stories. This is a learning source for future generations to come. My hope for the future is that my grandchildren maintain their culture and pass it on down through their generations. The most important thing, I think, is to remember who you are and maintain connection. Connection to each other and connection to country. It's really important and it's very important for Aboriginal people. I will get my weapons. Barai, hurry, grab your weapons. Your baron, your marine, your bala bundi, my spear, my bundi, my boomerang. I'll put my man belt on that holds my weapons. I will jump around and pretend, and I want you to see my straight aiming spear, but if you misbehave, it'll get serious. Thank you. <laughs> 